Hi, thank you for joining us on the Raise Up podcast. I'm Athena. Carly Graham. And we have a special guest today that is going to be a great treat for everybody listening to the podcast today. So, like everybody knows him already, so I don't even know why we have to introduce him. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> uh, everybody in our region knows him. 100%. So we have John Schwartz from Perfectionist. Hey, how you yes. doing, everybody? Well, and welcome. Thank you for letting us, uh, let me join the show. I appreciate it. It's thank awesome. you for coming on. Uh, Absolutely. So John has been a partner of ours for, I, I can't even say, I, I, probably the 24 years oh, that yeah. we've been doing it. The whole it. time? The whole yeah, the whole time. time. I remember coming to get my first auto start and I had to pay full price because That's John right. said, everybody has to, your first hit, it's not for free. You I'm have like, to pay for your first hit. I was hit. like, who's Charlie Grimm? Yeah, who's, yeah, it's like, who's, who's this like, busy guy? Who's I was busy? like, hey, we need it. We need to get some auto starts and stuff going. <laughs> I think that's back when we had C&G Services too. Maybe. And then we had, um, we had C&G Services, our snow plowing, and then we were just breaking into the limo yep. side. And yeah. that was in 2000. That was crazy, man. I think we saw you a little bit actually before we had the limos and we started doing the limos as C&G Services a little bit before because I rented some space from John behind mm -hmm. the uh in the old yard where mm -hmm. he has the covered parking that was yeah. when i first started running from john the there yeah. Mm. yeah back when you were on the other I, side i of the think building. we're aging ourselves there bro we are very well <laughs> aged ourselves <laughs> well and you know one of the key things that john's product solved for us was being able to unlock our limousines when the drivers lost the keys in the car. I don't even think it was the drivers. I think we have more problems with the customers trying to unlock and get mm. the doors. Because mm. we had Bach 1 back in the day, or mm. 20, a 10 passenger limousine, it had the lock and the unlock button. So the driver would get out the door and mm. everything would be unlocked. And the driver, and I mean, the passenger in the back would hit the lock button. And then they would shut the door and they'd be like, oh no, we can't oh, get in. That's right. Yeah, so that was 20, almost 25 years ago, mm. solving that issue. And then the other issue that you, the technology advanced, and then we were able to uh, start the car from our phones and unlock the car from our phones and track the car from our phones. So his company uh, does a multitude of things, which Sean, we want you to explain what that, all of your offerings are, but in particular, BAC and AMT use the drone system yeah. that yeah. has been really helpful. Yeah, it's, so. been, it's been a journey. Definitely a lot of technology. You guys have been a, one of the helping hands in making the technology better for everybody with the, the amount of vehicles you guys have had. You know, they had to, I remember a couple of times me and Charlie were laughing because they had to redo the apps. Maybe we have more vehicles. They're like, man, it's not supposed to hold as many. You know, now they now we have an endless amount of vehicles you can add because of you guys. So. Yeah, it wasn't, John. It was like four to six they, or something. They like cap, that it used to be like 10. And then, yeah. Yeah, then it was like, oh, now we need like 20. And then it was like, now we need 40. And then like, man, you just make it 100. Yeah. We're like, now it's like, okay, we need over 100 now. You know, so that was, a, yeah, it was definitely a fun challenge. But the nice thing with our company, so obviously uh, what Athena's talking about is how CompuStar, our brand, started in Alaska. Um, so I actually started with CompuStar before Perfectionist. The owner of Perfectionist uh, bought it in 95 and then came up with this brand CompuStar in 98. And then I came on in 99. And then uh, that basically grew in Perfectionist. And uh, now we're the biggest security company in North America, which is pretty amazing. We just celebrated our 25th year in December. So that was pretty cool. But, uh, but yeah, through that with Drone Mobile and all these types of things, being able to own... Uh, the manufacturing, the hardware side, the software side, web development, all in house, that's where we can make those changes to accommodate your vehicles, you know? So, because it's like another company, you know, you're just calling in a rep, hey man, you know, we have a yeah. suggestion, you know? But okay. with us being part of the R&D team, it's like, hey, I need this change and it happens in, you know, a couple of days, it's there, you know, so. Now, if I remember right, uh, Jason Lee was the founder of CompuStar. Was that correct? That's right, yeah, Jason Lee. And yeah. then he was also your mentor. I mean, like, oh, like you yeah. work for Jason, and mm -hmm. he is, like, I remember I remember working at Pierce Street Maddox, and Jason was across the street selling auto starts and stereo systems and mm -hmm. stuff out of that, which would be the old Alaska, uh, Alaska um, Club building. That's and right. Then, yeah, that right there. So I know APD's got that place over there, and mm -hmm. they kind of do some retrofitting, but... I remember he's there because I remember working at Pierce Street and he had limos and all that yeah. stuff over there. And we would help get them for some of our talent, some of our mm -hmm. people. So we'd go over there and talk to him. Jason was just a hustler from that time on. Yeah, he has, a, he has an interesting story. You know, he was a business lawyer by trade and then kind of like most of us, you know, kind of had like a midlife change and just said, hey, took his whole family. They moved from Oregon to Alaska and then. He bought Perfectionist, he used to be called Perfectionist Car Care Center, then he had Touch of Class Limo, yeah. and then Perfectionist Car Detailing. And it was just kind of a mess. I think he didn't, you know, he just bought it and didn't really know. He was just, going in all these different directions. Yeah, he's just trying to figure it out. Then he had a couple guys, and they're like, yeah, we're going to help you. And it was just, it was a big mess. Like, well, I, I hate to say, when I came on in 99, it was, uh, 
I was like the spy of the company and, you know, Jason wanted me to go there. And I, I came from a really prestigious shop and uh, I remember me and him arguing and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go work at that shop. I'm working for CompuStar. I'm not working for perfectionists. And, you know, eventually I lost because he's the boss, you know. Right, so right. I ended up, he's like, just be my spy. Let me know what's going on. And so I remember they were dropping my toolbox off on the big flatbed, you know. And uh, so I come in and I'm looking at the guys. They're looking at me and we're just kind of like, I said, look, you don't like me. I don't like you. So I'm just going to blow my cover. I'm a spy. Okay. I'm Jason spy. Anything you do, I'm going to tell Jason. So don't mess up. Don't screw up nothing. That was your introduction, that was my introduction. to working at Perfectionist. Because we, we, we all knew each other from the industry. Sure. But, but, you know, we all came from the best shop at the time and then to and the worst shop. Who was that back in the day? That was uh, Safe and Sound. Safe and Sound. Yeah, Terry. Yeah, Terry yeah. Spessard yeah. was amazing. He, uh, yeah, I got, a, you know, pretty cool with that guy. He was like a second father to me, too. And uh, you remember back when you worked for somebody, right? Like yeah. you, you put your two-week notice in, you know? So at the time, I worked for Terry since I was 18. And, uh, Going into 21, 22, if you can imagine, I was pretty cocky, you know, so I was one of the best technicians in Alaska at the time, and uh, so all these little shops, pop-ups would try to hire me, you know, hey, come run my shop, you know, you're working over there, and I remember, um, you know, going to Terry, and like, hey, Terry, I'm, I'm giving my two-week notice, man, and he's like, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm going to go I'm gonna go work for Athena, you know, she got a new shop, she wants me to come run it. Mm, nah, I don't, Athena's going to go out of business, don't, you're not going to go over there, go back to work, and I'm like, I'm giving you my two-week notice, I'm quitting, okay? No, go back to work. That's not a good good fit for you. And I'm like, all right. So I just say, hey, man, sorry. You just listen to it. Sorry, Athena, I can't come work for you. <laughs> Terry told me no. You know, so I probably did that four times. And uh, finally, was, was that him more looking out for you at that time? Oh, absolutely. Thinking, Terry he... is he's the one of the most amazing humans on the planet. He's he, pretty good salt to the earth. He is. Yeah, he is incredible. He's been in the industry. He's like a godfather. You know. Sure. And um, it's. Uh, I remember when the the copy star situation happened. I. Uh, I was at Red Robin on Diamond, and basically Jason, you know, invited me to lunch, and he slid the remote on the table, the very first two-way. So basically, they I remember that one. yeah, they created the, the first two. Antenna on That's the front, right. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, you know, this is '99, so it was like this is like Star Trek, you know, it's like dude, dude, like whoa, like this is crazy. And you know? so the two-way meaning that it, it's going to page you back. It'll page you back with a right, beep that right. your your car is locked. That's or right. Okay. And so at the time, there was nothing like that in the whole industry, and and he used the first one. So uh, I was like, oh, my God, you know, then at the time, Viper was like the biggest company. It was like Apple back then, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was like, what do you want to do with this? And he goes, I want to beat Viper. And I'm just like, bro, you're crazy. This is the biggest company in the world, man. Are you nuts? Like, he's like, I can beat him with this. And I was like, Psh, all right, man. So then he was like, well, what would it take for you to come join us? And I was like, Psh. You know, I'm, I'm the man. You know, I was like, I need 15 bucks an hour, and I need to go to CES every year. <laughs> and then he's like, deal. And I was like, oh, I should ask so for 16. Cheap. <laughs> yeah, I should ask for 16 bucks an hour. You know. Well, back then, like that was good, that was money. good money. Oh, really? I mean, it took me, you know, five years of safe and sound to make that. You know, I started making when I first worked. I was making like 650 an hour or something like that. Were you at his original uh, property when he was off of Dowling? No, I, I, I. So right when they moved into Old Seward, that's when okay. they, I got hired over there. So. And um, anyway, so I went to Terry and I said, hey, Terry, man, I got this opportunity. They want me to be the head tech for this new company called CompuStar. They make remote starts. And he was like, now that's a good opportunity. Now I'll take your two-week notice. Oh, that's awesome. And that was it. So September 1st, 1999 was my first day at CompuStar. And then it was incredible, man, you know, being a, like, you know, Think about your first place. You, I don't know. When I met you, you were on Arctic, right? You had that, uh, what's the address on that? The 54th, 54th or something? Yeah. 54th. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, West 54th. So you remember that space, yeah. right? And you're like, man, you know, you we're going to make it one day, you know? And then, so when we started at CompuStar, we were in a 1,200 foot, uh, no, no, it was a 1,000 foot room, and we had three desks, and then Jason had an office, there was another guy, Nam, then it was uh, this guy, Brian, me, and then we had like the bookkeeper. And then, it was a thousand feet, and then we That's would. That's the same uh, complex right now. No, that was it. Was actually over here by. Uh, or is that the one? Was that Fire Ridge? It was no, no. This one was over here. The, there's a Korean church right over here next to uh, uh, Sicily's. So okay, if you we, drive yeah, down, yeah, yeah, yeah no you order. drive down to Sicily's. There's a Korean yep. church there. Yeah, more familiar. So yeah, so uh, that what we had. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, we yeah we rented uh, yeah he rented a thousand foot spot, and every day at like noon we would all get together, stop working, we would go in the shipping room, and we'd pack units together. And I'm not even kidding, we would like, so back then a case of remote starts would be 10 remote starts in a box. If we sold a case, we would literally go out to dinner and celebrate. So we probably just spent all the money we just made, you know, but we were like, we sold a case, you know, we're going to make it one day, you know. Now to see, like my showroom I have a perfectionist is 1,250 feet. So 250 feet bigger than the first copy star. You yeah. Know? Just a showroom. Yeah, just a showroom. So it was pretty amazing. Um, 
you know, to see all these things happen. And then so in 2020 during COVID, uh, Viper Direct Electronics ended up getting bought out by another company and they kind of broke it up. So at that point, that moved us to the number one position. Wow. So I remember calling Jason. Jason and I was like, Jason, how you feeling? Like when the article came out, how you feeling today? And he's just like, man, you know, 20 years it took us. But as we did it, man, you know, yeah. we never stopped. And now, you know, now we have multiple facilities. you got a huge facility in Texas and big one in Seattle. We just opened up a big one in, uh, in Saskatoon in Canada. And so it was just, you know, and it's all privately held. Jason's had it the whole time and it's just amazing, you know, so. And through that, that's like been part of perfectionist, you know. Um, that's been your journey through yeah. perfectionist. Yeah, yeah, and following, you know, following in those things. So, um, so perfectionist itself, when I ended up getting it, so we were talking about off camera some of the challenges. So at that time, perfectionist was so bad. And, you know, I would literally beg people to give me a shot. And all my friends were like, why would you go to this place? Like, it's so bad, you know. And uh, so for the first month after I told everybody I was a spy, you know, I'm taking notes and taking notes. A month later, Jason takes me out to dinner, and then he's like, okay, let's let's break it down. I was like, you know, I'm flipping pages. Look at this, 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 this. And I said, man, you're losing 10, 15 grand a month, you know, just in theft and damage, you know. It's crazy. And it, w it was just such a messed up situation. And then uh, he was finally like, well, what do you think I should do? And I said, bro, I said, you... The shop is so bad, I was, I'd was i fire everybody and start over. I said, you're already the worst. Like, right. you can't get any worse than this. It's so bad. And then he was just quiet for, like, 10 minutes. And I was like, oh, God, this guy, he's going to fire me. You know, <laughs> like, oh, I messed up. And then 10 minutes later, he's like, okay, tomorrow you're the new manager. Um, you fire everybody else, and I'll fire the store manager. And then we'll start tomorrow. You're going to be the new boss. And I'm like, I don't know how to run a company. I'm only 22, you know. And he's just like, well, I don't know how to run a company either, obviously. So we'll figure it out together. So... So the next day I went in, we had about eight, nine guys, and I pulled everybody together, and I said, well, I kind of told you all this is going to happen, and so we're letting everybody go today. You can finish today, or you can leave now, but today's everybody's last day. Where were you guys installing then, John? So we, were, we, were, we, were, we were in where Shirt Alaska is now, so okay, that was so the first the, the, part, yeah. where I met you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so we were there. So we're That's a great location. So that was state, this, state of the art. This is fascinating to mm -hmm. me, because I've never heard a manager coming in and, like, firing everybody yeah. and starting over, so well, tell the us. the owner, I mean, that was the like, owner, too. Well, tell well us, he let me fire everybody, oh, and he fired the manager. He fired the manager, yeah. but then, yeah. John, so what was the process so, in, like, so rebuilding? The, yeah, so the next day, uh, literally, so this is, uh, you know, going What about all your your customers too like holy cow. well the funny we didn't have a lot of customers okay. then honestly like because we were so bad and then uh, so the next day i came to work and i was by myself you know so it took two months before we hired our first employee so i was answering all the phones doing all the installs because everybody that worked for CompuStar, they were more like salespeople. They none of them were techs i was like the only tech so you know i was uh you know i always had a pocket full of business cards and like even now i still got a pocket full of business cards and I, everywhere i go and have business cards give us a shot give us a shot you know, did the funny side. I don't know if you remember when we had the huge banner on the side, under new management and all kind of stuff, and tried everything, you know, yeah. and just literally would just beg people. And, and then at that point, had to super over deliver, you know, and give away a lot of labor, give away a lot of time just to, you know, get one person. So in advertising, there's a term called a sneezer. And uh, I read this in a book. So back then, so Jason was an amazing boss, but he wasn't a great teacher. Right, in the sense of he would just be like, Hey, tonight I need this report. Okay, bye. And he was like, wow, What the heck? Is, like, what's a PL? I don't know what a PL is, you know, things like that. So, what I would do is um, I didn't really understand mentors and things. So, I have three daughters, as you guys know. And uh, so, every Sunday, I would take my kids to Barnes and Noble and they would go get like a kid book. And then I would think of what I, what I sucked at this week, you know, time management, leadership whatever it was and then Something i was you wanted to get better at. yeah so i would read a book a week and and then so i just had so many books on you know business on stuff trying to figure out you know and sometimes you just get a paragraph out of a book that changes everything you know yeah but we would we call uh, that a nugget yeah a nugget. nugget there you go yeah. <laughs> so one of the things i read about uh was a sneezer and that is finding someone like you know like charlie huge influencer right so you get charlie on the team and then Charlie's naturally going to tell everybody because he's sneezing on everybody, you know? So I was like, oh, I love that. I need to find more sneezers, <laughs> you know? And that's what grows your business. Like, oh, man, you know? And, you know, Charlie is like, oh, man, I need to find someone to tow my truck. Oh, I got you. Hold on. Yeah, got to come. My buddy perfections, yeah. you know, instantly, right? That's a sneezer. So that was the focus. And really, it was it was very, very hard, very challenging. And, uh, you know, the first couple of years, our revenue was so low. I mean, you know, we were doing like 300 grand a year, which is, I mean, nothing. I mean, you can't even, you can't even get a paycheck out of that, you know, after all the rent and expenses and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it was just, I think part of the entrepreneur journey on that is just 
you know, they say it takes 10,000 hours to be a professional, right? But how That's many correct. hours, yeah. Yeah, how many hours do we have off the clock? You know, I mean, it's 24 seven, you never stop it, you know? And so I got our first employee about two months later and then it was so nice because he could answer the phones and I could install and then we'd change days. I'd be in the front, he'd be in the back. And we just, you know, kept trying to produce the best we could do and then the technology get better and things like that. And then, uh, so um, the cool part, I guess, is we kept pushing and pushing. Revenue kept getting better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And then finally in 2000, it's kind of funny because in 2008, you know, the economy crashed, right? Or starting to crash. It was a little late for us, like 09. But we, uh, that was the first year we basically hit our first million in revenue, which was humongous because I didn't understand profit and loss and all that. I just knew we had to hit a million in revenue to be a real company, I felt like. And um, so I remember calling Jason um, in September and I was like, hey man, I think we're gonna do it this year. I think we're finally gonna hit a million bucks. He's like, why do you say that? I said, man, it's not even September yet and we're already at like 875. Yeah, yeah, we're already at 875, we haven't even hit the snow. Yeah. And then, uh, so sure enough, you know, we ended up finishing the year at like 1.2 million. Our first, you know, first million, it was amazing. But the amazing part was um, in October, October 1st, our CPA called me from Seattle and she was like, hey, I need you to go to Wells Fargo. You need to go sign some paperwork and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, well, Jason changing bank accounts because he'd always just change bank accounts, you know? And she was like, no, he gave you half the company. I was like, what? And she was like, yeah. He, he didn't he, like call you and precursor no, that? he didn't call me nothing. The CPA called me and told me. She said, I need to go to the bank, sign these paperwork. So he made a new corporation, everything, and gave me half the company. And that was because we finally hit the million. You know, that was like, so it that took me, like yeah, it took me eight years. Well, he just, so I feel like, you know, for freedom, you have to find someone that loves a company as much as you or more. And I love perfectionists more than he did. So his, his baby was CompuStar. So by me loving perfectionists, it set him free to go build CompuStar. And then yeah. he got to, you know, create his dreams. So he just, you know, ended up doing that. So, um, so I ended up getting half the company and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, you know, and, uh, but then, you know, the, then after we did the, uh, the revenue, we had, you know, a certain amount of profit, I don't know, a couple hundred grand of profit or something. And then I get the K1, and I'm like, what the heck is this thing, you know? And I owed, you know, I had, and it was like 75000 that I owed and uh, whatever is like additional income, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, called up Jason. I said, why did you do this to me? I don't, I don't have any money. I don't know how many supposed to pay the taxes, you know? And so I think anybody that got their first K1, you probably, you know, sure. freaked out too, you know? And then... Uh, you know, he's just like, ah, you idiot, you know, you can do distribution to blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't understand this stuff. So anyway, obviously learned how to do it later on. But uh, So you first panicked because you got the K-1 and you're like, am I going to owe for all this money? Oh, yeah. And then and then he explained, well, you can take draws out of the Yeah, account. yeah. He's like, yeah, you, you know. And But at first I was just like, oh, my God, why did he do this to me? You know, like, is he mad at me? You know, and, uh, and then a couple of things happened in 09 that was such a, like, huge part of where we are now is that when the economy crashed, and um, so imagine I had my first fifty thousand dollars I ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. Like okay, like whatever it was through how I got it through distributions and stuff. But I was like, man, we're so on fire. Let's open up a let's open up another business. Let's open up Perfections Home Audio and Security. I was like, it all fits the same amount of letters. Everything is perfect. And then my brother-in-law, um, Eddie, he's amazing home audio. So so this is a great business rule I learned that businesses are, are systems dependent, not people dependent. So what I did is I took that 50 grand, I rented another spot in the same building and we like outfitted it out, made it look like a nice uh, theater room, you know, and I sent Eddie out to school and we bought, you know, all the best equipment and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I put all this education and everything on Eddie. And um, so the whole time Jason's like, I don't know if it's a good idea, man. I think the economy is something bad's about to happen. You know, he's really smart about this stuff. And I'm like, nah, man, we're on fire. Dude, we just did a million bucks, you know? And yeah. So I'm an idiot, of course. <laughs> you know, and, you're uh, learning. I'm learning, yeah, yeah okay. Well. It seems like you're kind of, I mean, you know, we've all had a kind of models we championed. And if I remember right, who kind of did the audio and did the home audio was mm -hmm. Shimmix. Shimmix, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Shimmix, yeah. I mean, that used to be the place. I remember mm -hmm. they had a, you'd go in there and wait for your stereo, and they had a movie room. You'd go in there and have popcorn and sit down. And amazing. I remember sometimes we'd go in there and take our lunches and sit down. I'm like, yeah. are you guys buying anything? I'm like, no, we're just watching a movie yeah. and the popcorn. Yeah. It was, uh, that was such an anchor of, uh, of oh, a place. Oh, yeah. And you know, the greatest compliment for us is that like when they closed down, the owner told like one of our installers that we've had now 12 years, literally he was like, go to Perfectionist and get a job. That's sure. the only other place. And then uh, Terry and Joe both frequent our store and get their installs done there and everything. So to me, I'm like, wow, that's huge, you know? That's awesome. Yeah, so uh, ended up um, opening up this home audio business, everything, like it was done, man. And we were like, all right, let's go, we're open for business and everything is great. 
So we probably ran for like a month or so. Then the economy crashed. I'm like, oh my God, you know. So I'm standing by my door, like every day praying to God, like, God, give me one car today. Just give me one car. Because unlike COVID, everybody could travel back then, you know. So everybody yeah. was gone. We had the most beautiful summer ever. So everybody's out in the woods. So, oh my God. So it, it was really, really bad. That's I think it's where all my gray hair came from, honestly. Was, was that my, here? I was so stressed. I thought it was the three kids. I know that's well, where I'm getting mine from. Three dollars <laughs> is tough, man, but but... The scariest thing is, like, I feel like as an owner, you know, is that if you can't make payroll, you know, to me, I feel like, man, I'm so responsible for everybody that, you know, I don't care about the the, the vendors and at that moment. All I care about is my guys got to pay their bills, and I'm like, yeah. how am I going to do this? So, and then back then, I didn't have any lines of credit, didn't have no, you know, really no high credit card, you know, nothing. It was just everything. So, I ended up selling everything I owned. I had a car. I sold my girl's car. I sold my motorcycle every tool that I could sell. And so I have this purple scooter at my shop. It's a 94 Honda Elite. And honestly, to this day, like we started up every summer and I never sell it because I rode that. Me and my girl rode that every day, back and forth to work, to the grocery store. We both wear backpacks and it, whatever we could put in a backpack, that's all we could get for groceries. It was genius. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, seriously. And I still have that scooter. People try to buy it. I see it all the time. It. I'm like, no, I'll never that sell scooter's it. scooter's a reminder of what for you? Struggle, man. Just like struggle and just like the gratitude that I had that. Because, I mean, just to be able to drive 40 miles an hour up and down Diamond to go take her to work or go over here or go over there, you know. And yeah. So that was a big moment. But then the, the kind of next punch in the face was, is, you know, obviously home audio died off a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. But then my sister comes in my office one day and she's like bawling her eyes out. So, of course, you know, I'm like, oh, who do I got to kill? You know, did, what, what did Eddie do? I got to go kill this guy, you know? And then she's just like, uh, my boss is closing a company here, and, and we're, he's moving to Texas. And I said, okay, what's wrong? She goes, well, he wants me to move to Texas, too. And I'm like, I just put every penny I had in my whole life into Eddie for this business for him and you to have. And, and she's like, I know. That's why I'm so sad. I don't know what to do, you know? And then so literally within a month, they had to move to Texas. How was the home, home audio doing at that time? I mean, it was, was it... I mean, it was decent. You know, we were we were definitely getting some jobs. But, I mean, we were only a couple months old. You know, we did, like, the home shows and things. Yeah. But but just, uh, you know, have this situation. And then I don't know nothing about it because I put everything into him. So I was like, I learned that lesson there. You're like, oh, my God. I just, I put so much, you know, information in him. And now he's gone. And then so they had to move, and then I had to figure out with John how to, like, find someone to rent the place. And I had to, like, you know, try to sell everything in there. And, oh, my God. And then, of course, Jason's like, mm-hmm. And, you know, I told you <laughs> not to do this, you know. And then uh, and then the vendors start calling. And, you know, hey, man, you know, we, we need to get payment. We need to get payment. And I'm just like, God, you know. And everybody's struggling, of course. So I said, guys, I said, listen, I, I'll give you everything I can give you. But I said, just let me get to the snow. I said, just let me get to the snow, and then I'll, I'll get back in it. And then luckily we had an amazing winter. You know, we had a ton of snow, and then we got remote starts. So I ended up I ended up probably being, I don't know, man, almost probably like 75000 in debt really bad. And that was really a lot. I mean, a huge number for me back then. And then, um, but luckily, you know, probably by the middle of November, I finally got all the vendors caught up. Everybody was cool. But that moment, I think, for the next 15 years helped us because, we, you know, we took care of it, you know, and, and it, was just, it wasn't like I went out of business and kind of screwed everybody over, you know, so we really focused on that. So you came to a point where everything's falling apart and the person that you invested in is not invested in you. Yeah. And well, so I think I think he was moving with his family. I mean, he's yeah. still close to Eddie. Eddie's still married to his sister. Well, so. what I mean by that is that you you made an investment in him, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the same it didn't match you, basically. Well, I think I I think as a, as the the leader in that moment, I I chose poorly because I didn't think I didn't think of the long game, and I think in business you have to think the long game because you know a lot of times I feel like as entrepreneurs, right? We get you know I know me and you've had so many cars, we get so excited. Oh, I got this idea, I'm going to do it, and then we go start buying stuff and we start thinking, but then we're like, oh dang it, that didn't work out like I was hoping it was going to, or that wasn't going to be the play that I should have done. So I think in that moment, it really, you know, like my investment strategy is much different now, you know, and, and now I want to know every job and I want to be able to do every job in my shop in case something like that happens, you know. I just would never, I just want, don't ever want to be an owner that like, I don't know how that works, you know, because we, we need to know, right? We're the leaders. Like you can jump in any vehicle here and drive it all day long, you know. Yeah, but don't ask me to put a reservation in because then I'm going to stumble at that. So, well, yeah. And you and I have talked about that too. It's <laughs> like... um there's a right 
the right place in the right balance. seat. There, there, there's a balance of what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Like you can only imagine some of the ones that we follow and those people, those guys probably don't know half the system organizations that they do for their companies, but they know mm -hmm. how to put the right people in the right, right seat to do those things. And, and you're right. You do have that ebbs and flows of people coming mm -hmm. in and out and you should have some general knowledge about what's going on. But well, you know, the tough thing in my industry too, I feel like is uh, we're very technical, you know, so it's hard to find a body, you know, and I, it's kind of funny. Like I'll go to like some like, like crumble cookies or something. Yeah. And I walk in there, there's like 20 people in there making cookies. I'm like, man, I can't believe I can't find one of these people to come to my shop and learn how to do this, you know? So it's tough to, in some situations, to to be able to find that, that body to put in that place because, you know, then you do it and then there's so much training you have to give them. I tell them, I need six months with you to, to get you to where you can be, you know, kind of self-sufficient, you know? So that's been a challenge, you know, finding finding great staff and things like that. Like some of the, you know, the amazing people have, like, Aaron's been with me. Aaron's my, you know, my store shop manager. He's uh, 17 years now. He's been with me. Yeah. Other guys, 12 years, you know. And now I got a couple of newbies, but even the newbies are like five years in now, you know. So, the so newbies that's, are five years yeah. in and they're still called the newbies. Yeah, they're still the newbies. Well, yeah. Because they're still, they're still junior to everybody else. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so I think that, and then the, the thing too is like, man, you know, I've lost everything three times. And, you know, I had to rebuild myself. And, and by doing that, and then you just... You know, you get scared of doing some big things because it's like at any moment, like, you know, it's funny now, like Aaron yells at me all the time because let's say, let's say we had two no-shows or three no-shows or something happens, you know, and there's like, no, I'm like, oh my God, we're going out of business, dude. Like, this is not good. People, people are mad at us. And Aaron's like, oh my God, John, somebody might got sick, you know, <laughs> it's just a bad day. We'll be busy tomorrow, you know, but, but they don't understand what it feels like when it's like you lose everything, you know, and you just don't know how you're going to. You know, I always say it's like that's the water, you know, and, you're, and we're at the bottom of the pool. We're trying to get out to the air, you know, and, you know, that's that's always my fear that, you know, like any moment we can get wiped out or something, you know, yeah. but, and I got to get over that. I'm trying. I mean, it's 25 years later. I'm still like <laughs> nervous. No, I mean, John, as we've talked about every single time, it's ebbs and flows. Like mm -hmm. it, it, you'll have these ebbs and flows that come through there. But if you look at your bottom lines and you, everything you go across, which we have talked about this many times mm -hmm. in our company and everything, and our financials and IRS and all the other things going, it's just like, it, it's all going to happen. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's our anxiety level. You have to do it. And then once you can let go of that stuff, like <clears throat> I, I don't have any of those. I wish not say I should, I have less fears of those things happening in mm -hmm. my life now, even though we lost like a, a pretty big contract that we went out to, but we've already had phone calls of them coming back. So yeah. it's one of those things that we just figured that, it wasn't our time of season. It wasn't what's going on. And then we have to just figure out what our next step is. And that's right. Panicking it kind of as like when we were talking about our whole COVID thing, it's like, you know, we had to sit back, breathe and figure out what's our next step on this. Everybody was shutting down their doors. People were getting 14 day quarantines. Airlines were shutting down flights. Like, okay, how can we partner up with people? How can we make this even better than what we were doing before? And mm -hmm. I think it's just us sitting back, talking to somebody sensible and making sure that we have, this and just saying okay we're not going to panic we're just going to go through this and we're going to make sure this happens and we're going to have a good mindset and go forward and see how we can um not take advantage of it i should say is is what's the opportunities in it yeah, what, what's our next opportunity that we can do in this like the covid everybody else was kind of uh they were they were shutting down doors and that putting their employees and laying people off and we're like how can we partner with the hotels? All these people have to get sick. They have to go somewhere. We had just started the ambulance company. Mm -hmm. We were done doing non-emergency. All of a sudden, we're doing 15, 20 transfers a day. Well, there's something here to this. So I think timing's everything, John, is what I was trying to say. And I think you had to go through those rough seas and rub those things to get to where you're at now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you know, with the history of 25 years, if there's a pandemic, if there is a, um, a, a financial downflow, you kind of have to just know where you need to go. And you kind of have like your... You have your bullet sheet. Like if we're going yeah. through a recession, here's my bullet sheet. I got to go through these steps here to make sure that we're secure, but we're open and we're going to now look for this kind of business and start yeah. going chasing after these people because these people still need to get all this maintenance on their truck and they might be shut down, but might, this might be the perfect time to pick up 30 or 40 of their vehicles in their fleet and I can start working on because yeah. come when this pandemic ends, hey, I need all those vehicles going. You know? uh, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think and I think that's the nature of, of an entrepreneurial soul is that, yeah, we're going to figure it out. You know, what's that old saying that, an entrepreneur is going to figure out how to fix a plane while it's like literally almost hitting the ground. And then we know we'll like pull up right before it hits, you know? And sure. I, I feel like that is the most amazing analogy because how many times have you, you know, something happens and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, how are we going to figure this out? Like, all right, you know, like, you know, I had, 
a couple years ago, I had started another company. Actually, 10 years ago. Um, next year will be 10 years I started my other company. And, um, you know, I ended up leaving that company in 2018. And it was the craziest thing. So at the time, the company was probably worth a quarter million to me at, you know, myself at the time. And then so on a Monday, I lost that. And then on a Friday, we lost our biggest client at the time, which was worth another quarter million. So we lost a half a million in a week in cash flow. So, you know, at that moment, you're like, oh, my God, you know, that to us, that was, that was detri check. detrimental. I mean, you're talking 30, 40,000 a month in cash flow. And, uh, you know, I I was like, Phew. and I was I was going through a crazy relationship at the time, too, which didn't help at all. There. Remember? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I call you every day. And uh, anyway, uh, at that moment, the crazy part was, I think, was, uh, you know, to lose that half a million a week and then pulling together with the team probably like you know a couple weeks later like all right guys this is what happened how are we going to fix this and uh you know we got together and created a new now you know, who were the guys that you asked that question well, to? well so like Did you Aaron, have mentors or was it no, your team it was just my team you know my team and i had to apologize to them because i i fell i failed you know i made some decisions um when i started the other company where i had messed up was uh I should have had separate companies, but I ran everything through perfectionists, so then that affected that, that type of thing. And then, you know, just a lot of the personal stuff I let get in the way of stuff and decisions and things. So, you know, and then the other part of it, not leading the team to take care of the client that we lost. Because I was just like, hey, did you go check on the client? Yeah, yeah, they're good, they're good. We emailed them, you know. But I'm always like, no, you should go see them, bring them donuts, talk, you know, pizza yeah. or something, talk to them, see what's going on. And then for a couple of months, I never did. And I was like, yeah, we should have got a PO by now, you know, or something. And then sure enough, I finally call up there and I'm talking to my people. And I'm like, oh, John, we, they, they, yeah, they switched over to another vendor. And I was like, you know, so you're just like in the same week, you're like, oh, my gosh, man, like, this is crazy. Like, how can it get any worse than this, you know? But but then, you know, I think about the beginning when we didn't have anything or like, oh, nine, when it was like I had to sell yeah. everything. Yeah. But now I lost a half a million and we're like, we're still in business. You know, like, so small businesses, how many people could take a half a million dollar hit and kind of be like, oh, well, we'll figure it out, you know. So sure. then, so we created a new, like you said, we took opportunity, got into a different uh, category in the business. And then the next year we made 650 back. So we're like, okay, we made up that money plus some. And then it, and it's still an existing business now, which is great. So do you think that you would have actually, like, brought on that extra revenue stream had you not been in this experience of no, losing? Like, no. would you have even been looking for it? Well, again, I was so scared to invest because of what happened with my brother-in-law. Right. So now it's like, and I had to invest. So even though we had lost it, I had to like find the money somewhere to, yeah, you know, buy the machines and different things that we had to do to get the inventory in. So if I didn't lose that, then I wouldn't have got focused and said, okay, we got to come together and figure this out. Like, it's not just me, you know, I always tell everybody, you know, if someone does a bad install or somebody has bad service, they're not going to say, oh, John screwed it up. They're going to say perfection screwed it up. Yeah. You know, if you go into reviews, it's not very often you see a name. It's more the, the business. So, so I said this, you know, I always call perfection my big fat girl. I'm like, hey, man, this big fat girl been taking care of us. We got to take care of her, too, you know. And uh, so... You know, that was that was a huge challenge of that. And if I didn't lose all that, then, yeah, I wouldn't have got refocused to, to say, we got to figure this out. That was kind of like, this is going to hurt us bad if we don't figure out some way to get out of this. Right, you know? and so. it's like you focused on what it was that you guys wanted, which right. was to figure out the solution. So Absolutely. What I love about your story, John, is that you are this 20-something guy mm -hmm. who doesn't know anything about business. Like, mm -hmm. where where do you come from, like, was there, um, like, what's your heritage? Where where are you from? So I'm Thai and Polynesian. Um, so I was, it's kind of crazy. So my mom uh, went to labor in the air, and then she had to land in Iran. So I was actually born in Iran. And then we were there for a couple of days, which is haunted me my whole life because now it's on my passport. But uh, so we're in Iran for, like, say, a week, I guess, for the baby. Then went back to Thailand. And then my mom, she couldn't, uh, you know, she was very young, typical 70s story, couldn't take care of me. And then uh, she wanted to get to America, so uh, I got adopted and then came to America. I grew up in North Carolina. Um, the crazy thing was my biological father brought me here and, uh, and my mom. And then once we crossed the border, whatever we had to do, he took every single piece of paper that had my existence with him. So to this day, I don't even have a birth certificate. So, really? Yeah, so then I was like an illegal alien for a while. Then my, my dad, who adopted me... Um, 
you know, he had to figure this stuff out. He was in the Army, luckily. So, so I was like an illegal alien for a while, had a green card. And then when I was 13, I got my citizenship. And then um, moved here when I was 16. And then, uh, yeah, it was just, um, you know, it was, it was a pretty crazy journey. And then, uh, so when I was 14, um, I was working at this meatball, like, sub shop, you know. And what we would do is we would go on base every day and drop flyers off to all the barracks. And uh, so next door to that shop, there was a shop called DAS. It was called Discount Auto Sound. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and so this guy, so back then in the early 90s. If Tire, you, stereos, all kinds of He had like a Honda CRX that was like the car. Anyway, I was outside one day eating a sub, and this guy pulls up in this Honda. And, man, this thing had the craziest system. And I remember, like, you know, the building had these, like, eight-foot-tall windows. And he played, like, Baby Got Back. You know, it was like, boom, 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 boom. And the baby got boom. And a bass hit. And when that bass hit, the windows were like, I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to work here, you know. So I went over and begged the guy. I was like, dude, you got to let me work here, man. I work for free. I don't care. I'll sweep the floors. I'll clean the bathroom, whatever you want. He was like, man, get out of here, dumb kid. What are you talking about? And I was like, no, seriously, man, I got to do this. This is my life. I need to do it. All right, I'll give you a shot. So uh, then I, I quit the job, and the next day I was working there after school and learned everything I could learn. And then when I moved to Alaska, um, I went to East, and uh, me and my buddy Sal, we had opened up a business called The Sound Doctor. And... Uh, and it was funny because I didn't ha I didn't have any gear, but I was fixing everybody's stuff. And uh, so I was at my mom's house just building systems all summer type of thing. And, uh, yeah, some girl one day was like, man, you're so cool. You're like the sound doctor. And I was like, man, that's a cool name. So we went to get, like, hats embroidered and had a business license. And we were in high school handing out business cards. So all summer I was building systems. And then uh, so then Pyramid used to be open back on Fireweed. Yep. And uh, this guy named Shannon, he was the manager. And I would go over to him and buy stuff from him all the time. And uh, so finally, when I turned 18, he had moved to Safe and Sound. And then when I turned 18, he was like, man, you want a job? And I was like, heck yeah, I want a job. You know, like, I want to work in this shop. It's awesome. So so I started working there two days a week. And then, uh, you know, then ended up becoming one of their you know head guys after like four and a half years. And then went to Perfections and Coffee Star. And then kind of got, got thrown into the fire, you know, thrown into the kitchen, you know. And it's like, all right, now you're the boss. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what to do, you know, but. And the good part of that is you're still friends with Shannon. You still oh, talk to Terry. I ran into Terry uh, just a couple weeks ago at Cars and Huffman. Awesome. And uh, I'm like, Terry, and he's like, Charlie. So we sat and talked about a whole half an hour about his mm -hmm. building caving in and how things oh, was yeah. and how he sold it to Shannon. And he's now just kind of living his best life. Yeah, uh, man. He's, he, he's an incredible. I've, there's a great business book, and everybody, I think, has read it, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. And... Um, so at that time, Terry was my rich dad, and then, you know, unfortunately, my dad's a poor dad, you know. And then when I met Jason, then Jason's my rich dad, and then, you know, I hate to say my dad, he's the poor dad, but, you know, it's it's these people. But when you say poor dad, you're saying just in financial ways. Well, so the, in the book, yeah. it oh. talks about his his poor dad was the the educator. Right. He was the guy who was the, the scholar. Yeah. He get didn't the, value yeah. oh, you the entrepreneur. Read it? Oh, it's a phenomenal book. Yeah, it's basically, the, the idea is, yeah, like the, the dad was like, get a good job, get a good career, you get a pension, you know, sure. work hard, work hard your whole life. He was in this box. Yeah, but then the rich dad is like, no, you got to invest, you got to buy property, you got to build businesses, you know, you got to yeah. do these things. So, so yeah, so Jason and Terry were both that, you know, and I learned so much from them in that aspect that it was like, you know, uh, it's frequency, you know, being around these people and, and then you meet other people and then they all, everybody talks the same, you know, like meeting you sure. and you're always like, come on, John, you got to push it. You got to do yeah. something different. Get out of the office, you know? Uh, you know, man, that's like, well, it's still my biggest thing is that you <laughs> need to be your number one salesperson. I mean, yeah. you, are the, you are, you are the everything to perfectionist and you've built it that way and that's how you built where you are. But we see such a bigger vision for you and where yeah. perfectionist should be because as we've learned that we can put people in those positions and, and sometimes it's not the right person, the right seat. And we have to switch those seats a couple of times. But once you figure it, you can do that because you're your biggest asset in your company. You're yeah. the best salesperson ever. You can make things and snap decisions. That's when we go to corporate meetings and we go to things much easier for us to do it than our operations manager or anybody else can do it because we can make that decision yeah. right then and there and, and let them know they, do it. They, they don't have to wait for that answer. They don't have to rethink what's going on. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like, you know, the tough, the tough thing with the world for us right now, and, and I'm thinking, you know, like 100 feet above, looking five years, 10 years out, is, you know, I'm going to be 48 next month, you know. And, uh, you know, me and you both September Virgos, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Aaron, my best guy, this guy is incredible. He's going to be 35 this year. So 10 years from now, he's going to be 45, you know. Like, so us technicians are kind of fading out. You know, like I, I, I still love being in the install bay and building and doing things, 
Uh, one of our friends, uh, Corvette uh, RC, I'm about to do yeah. a bunch of stuff to his car today, you know. So, in, uh, so I think in the future, like, how much more life this perfection is going to have because the kids nowadays, they're not into cars as much as they used to be, you know. I mean, man, I remember when you were 16, I mean, we're the first day you turned 16, you're the DMV getting your license. But now these guys are... 18, 19. Yeah, the, the so other what's your parallel? That's where you get the fair. Well, that's where, so that's where like SoundShield comes in. You know, that's why I started this other company because like we just expanded into South Africa. We just got into Singapore now. You know, we're working on uh, Malaysia and Indonesia and all these different things. And it's like, I feel like as a business, the shift of it is, you know, you have to be able to serve more people. And, and, and absolutely your business model, right? And so for us, it's like, you know, I want to serve as many as I can, but we're limited with the doctors and we're limited, you know, my technicians are the doctors, you know, we're limited with that. We're limited with, it's crazy. It's, it's been, I've been doing 32 years in uh, Anchorage doing remote starts and still meet people that never had a remote start. It's crazy, you know, <laughs> but you know, eventually the challenges are like the, the new cars are so nice. You know, they, they're doing a really good job. The audio sounds good. The Bluetooth works good. You got backup cameras, you got everything. So to get people out of that, that's a challenge, you know. But, you know, we still have a great market. But, you know, I feel like SoundShield for me is the longevity because if I can serve the earth, you know, then there's cars being built everywhere in the earth. And that's that's the, the future, you know, for me and the staff, you know. You're not limited and, to Alaska. And right. that particular product that you're talking about, SoundShield, mm -hmm. that is the liner that dampens the road noise. Absolutely, yeah. That is like... I notice road noise in every car that I drive. <laughs> so you drive your Wagoneer and then she gets in something else, she's like, I can hear No, 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 even in the Hellcat. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm driving the Red Eye, mm -hmm. because I'm so low to the ground, yeah, yeah. I can hear a lot more. But mm -hmm. when I'm in the Wagoneer, it is just like, it is it is like, it is like such Tight. a nice Tightened. vehicle. Yeah. It, the, the Grand Wagoneer Obsidian model is what mm -hmm. I drive. Mm -hmm. And it is just... And how often do you, like, when you guys go out of town, you get, like, a rental car, but, like, a cheap one? Like, when's the last time you had, like, a no, cheap one? No, we don't usually like, get cheap cars. You should do it one time, and then you'll no. really, no, no, really, no, no, no. you'll really appreciate because how nice your car is. we try to rent the cars that we want to drive or what we Absolutely. do. Like, the last time so, we were in Arizona, we rented a wagon here, and it was great. I mean, we love it. I'll tell you, where let's, we get let's, stuck. Let's put a pause on this and see who take two on this, because let's go on to the second half. Thanks again for joining us on the Raise Up podcast. You can find us at raiseupmindset.com. Our socials link there so you can get anything that you need from Instagram, Facebook, our shorts. You can download the podcast straight from the website. If you're listening on another platform, please like, subscribe, share. We're just getting the word out on really the encouragement and um, propelling the entrepreneurial movement in our communities. Thanks again for listening. We've got something special at the end of our episodes now where it's called the Raise Up Response. This is just a sheet that if you wanna dive deeper, it's got questions, it's got takeaways from the podcast. Click the link below and you can request it. It'll take you to our website and find it in your inbox. Thanks again, bye-bye.